Okay, uh, thank you so much for letting me speak. I would like to uh, tell you about an optimal dividend problem. So it's, you will recognize a lot of the, not symbols because I use others, but uh, there will be similarities to the talk two days ago by, by Mauricio. Uh, but since we are not attempting to model uh, an insurance firm, we will see quite a few differences. So what we want to do, the general idea, is that we have a cash flow, uh, a flow of uh, revenue or profit, uh, and we want to know how to value it. In this case, we value it under a liquidity constraint, and the interpretation of that is that we have a firm with a certain amount of cash, and we see how much dividends can we get out of this firm with this cash flow. This is in contrast to uh, real options, where you would then be unconstrained. You can incur losses, and you only look at the optimal entry and or exit time. I will mention that briefly <laughs> later because it's, it's useful for a proof. So we have a cash flow rate. I will uh, sometimes call this cash flow, uh, although it's a rate uh, or profit. We pay out dividends, and they are, L denotes the cumulative dividends. Uh, and since dividends are positive, we, we want it to be non-decreasing. And the cash reserves are then a starting value X plus some cash flow minus the dividends. So when we pay out dividends, we take from the cash we have, and as you will see soon, we give it to the shareholders. I will use the following terminology. I say that the problem is de deterministic if we remove both the sources of randomness. That's, there's nothing weird about that. I will call it semi-deterministic if we have only one of the sources of randomness. Uh, we study these problems because we can say more about them. So we want to look at the total discounted uh, dividends paid out. And we, we think of that as the firm value. And we want to optimize this over all possible dividend policies. Uh, and the constraint comes in here through the theta, which we call uh, the bankruptcy time, uh, time of ruin in the previous talk. And it just says that when your cash level reaches zero, you're out of the game. So I'll start with the deterministic case because many of the properties uh, show up there and it's much, much easier. So we split it into two cases. Mu is either positive or negative. If it's positive, it will stay positive. So because of the dynamics, let me just show that again. So it's an einstein ullenbeck process. I forgot to mention that. The technical results mostly just use some kind of estimate on the, on the first and second moments. Uh, so we could use something else, but we will use einstein ullenbeck So in the deterministic case, if we start at a positive point, we will stay positive. Uh, the, sorry, I forgot to mention that as well. The mean is positive. So we assume that in the long run, we, we have a positive uh, cash flow rate. So what do we know? We know that bankruptcy will never happen because we will always have influx of money. We will never lose money and turn, uh, turn negative. So since bankruptcy will never happen, it would be suboptimal to keep reserves as a buffer against bankruptcy. Therefore, the value is the initial cash plus the discounted value of future cash flow. And everything is explicit, so we solve the OD, we plug in, and the actual uh, values are not important. But, so we move on to the more interesting case where we start with negative cash flow. We know that if we wait long enough, we will reach uh, 
profitability. Uh, but the question is, can the firm survive? And since it's explicit again, we can uh, do all the calculations. So we calculate the time it takes to reach a profitable state. So that's when mu is zero. And that's tau zero. And since we know how long it takes, we know the costs, we can calculate the total costs incurred before we reach that state. And we call that xp, so that's how much it costs. So if our starting cash is lower than xp, there is no point, because we will, before we are profitable, we will uh, go bankrupt. So, so then there is no point waiting, we pay out everything we have. Take the money and run, or a voluntary liquidation. However, if it's not, we can wait. We get whatever value we have when mu is zero. So you see that here. That's the value we have if we have waited. We, actually, we pay out the difference between x and xp. If we have xp, we're sure to survive, and then we wait for better times. So we have the value function. But let's look at a figure. Uh, I think it describes it better. So on the horizontal, horizontal axis, you have the, the initial cash flow rate. On the vertical axis, you have the initial cash level. And the solid line describes XB, so how much cash is needed at the starting point to survive until better times. And the dashed line is the today's value of, of uh, the cash flow if we wait. And the important thing to note is that they intersect here in this point, or they cross it even. So that means that on the left side of mu min, it's the value we would get if we wait is lower than what we uh, what we would have to pay during the time we wait. So below this point, the value function is identically x for any, for any cash level. So you pay out everything directly. Uh, and you will see these, I will just, below xp, as I pointed out, we perform a voluntary uh, liquidation. Above, we pay out dividends, so we reach xp. So uh, let's go to the uh, stochastic case. Uh, so this is the only attempt at a proof sketch I will uh, try to fit into this talk. Uh, we have in the, also in the stochastic case, we have a level behaving like mu min. In the deterministic case, we call it uh, mu star. Below this level, the value function is identically x. And that means that below this level, regardless of how much you cash you start with, it is optimal to just exit. So I think it's a cute proof, uh, mostly because of how uh, they do it in the economics literature. So the value function, we can bound it by this expression. And this is just integration by parts. Uh, but What's interesting about it is that this thing, it's a, uh, an optimal stopping problem, and in the economics literature, you would see, see it mentioned as a, it's a real option, and that's the unconstrained version of this problem. So that's the value of the cash flow if you have no cash constraints. So in economics literature, they would just, they would write that this one is smaller than this one without mention, but it's simple to do the math, but I haven't seen it in the, from, uh, from them. Anyway, so to this one, it's easy to find actually a polynomial super solution which attains the value zero. And since it attains the value zero for some new, there is a point where the value function is smaller than or equal to x, but the value function will always be bigger than or equal to x, because we can always pay out everything we have. 
So we know that there is a point where the value function is x, and by monotonicity in mu, uh, we know that it's true for all levels below. So that's just uh, the cute proof. So what do we know about this uh, more generally? So we know that there exists an optimal policy. Uh, the value function is continuous, which in turn give, gives us uh, dynamic programming. And we have comparison for the uh, dynamic programming equation. So we have uniqueness and we need it, or we are, we're happy to have this because it justifies uh, our numerical scheme. We use a slightly modified policy iteration scheme. Uh, so policy iteration means it's, a, it's an iterative scheme. You start with the policy, you calculate the corresponding payoff, and then you update your policy. And this is the part that's difficult to explain. You update the policy and do what is optimal, assuming that the payoff is the real payoff you will get. Uh, it's also called the Howard's algorithm. So I, we heard the, the term yesterday, I think. So we use a modified version just to get everything working. And we get figures. Uh, so again, we have the starting cash flow rate on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we have the cash level. The dark region means we're not doing anything. And the wh white regions means we're paying dividends. So we're moving in the white regions, we move vertically, since we, when we pay dividends, we take from the cash level. And in the d dark regions, we just uh, let the, uh, we just go where the Brownian motion takes us. And again, you see here that to the left here, this is what I mentioned before. So we have this mu min or mu star regardless of the cash level, we exit. But here is the most interesting part, this region. It's a band strategy is optimal. So as long as we're above a certain level, we stay in the game. But at some level, which is away from zero, and that's the important part, we perform a voluntary liquidation. Uh, and in the rest of the region, it's a barrier strategy, which means we pay out dividends until we reach the barrier, and then we just, uh, yeah, we see what happens from there. We move around in the, in the dark region. So why did I show the deterministic case? The reason is that it makes the interpretation of these two lines easy. The bottom line, I'd like to interpret it as, as the line which says when, when it's a point staying in the game. And as you know from the deterministic case, this XB, which had a similar curve, tells you if you're below this line, you probably won't live long enough to uh, see positive times. Uh, so to me, that's precisely this line. The fact that it, it expands a bit, uh, due to the stoch stochastic uh, nature of the problem uh, is because in the deterministic case, as long as you're on that line, you're fine. But here you have to have some, uh, some buffer. Uh, and I would also like to say that most of the characteristics of these figures uh, are the same regardless of reasonable parameters. Uh, also, when we look at the semi-deterministic problems, uh, they're pretty much the same. If all parameters, aside from the, uh, the Brownian motion uh, volatilities, uh, if they're turned on and off to get the semi-deterministic or the stoch fully uh, stochastic problem, I wouldn't, without really comparing them side by side, be able to tell the difference. Uh, so you really see this kind of behavior regardless of the problem. And can also extend this to allow some kind of debt. The general structure stays the same. This line will, of course, follow 
will be shifted a, a bit away from the bankruptcy place, but the rest stays the same. Uh, you change parameters, you might lose the decreasing property of this one, but that's about it in terms of uh, general characteristics. And the main annoying thing uh, about the problem, I don't think you can see it here, I can't, but uh, we have uh, non-concavity in uh, both variables uh, in, in this band region. So, which makes it uh, harder than we hoped to study. So, thank you for listening. Um, just a bit of a caveat, this is a bit out of context with the uh, 